When I was a little girl, my favorite thing in the whole wide world to do was sit on the carpeted floor of my grandparents' room at my grandmother's feet and look at obituaries. Yes, it was a very uh, strange thing for a child to do, but it was a thing that my grandmother and I did together. And she was the biggest, strongest woman I had ever known. I would soon come to know that she was perhaps the smartest too. It took some time, but around about when I was maybe 14 or 15, I realized that my grandmother who had worked as a maid in a hotel much like this one, who had reared nine children, pushing them toward graduation from high school, could neither read nor write. It was a startling revelation. My grandmother, much like your grandmother, much like many Bahamian grandmothers, would grease my scalp on Saturday nights and would draw prickles out from the bottom of my feet, lighting matches to needles. Uh, she would send me to the tree to pick my own switch for spankings. <laughs> and early on Sunday morning, she would rise and she would cook a full Bahamian meal, which we know is miraculous in and of itself, before 10 a.m., where she would don her usher whites and she would venture out to the church bus with her Bible and church hymnal in tow. Women like my grandmother grew up in an era of muted ambition and limited opportunity. They grew up in a world where they were told to stay in their place. They grew up in a world where even popular culture reinforced the absence of their complete somebodiness. Where songs like, brown skin gal stay home and mind baby. Brown skin gal stay home and mind baby. Well, your father gone away on a sailing boat. And if he don't come back, stay home and mind, baby. How would that be possible? <laughs> In the absence of the father for the woman to stay at home and mind, baby, she would probably have to venture out into the world as a maid or as a washerwoman or as a straw vendor or a farmer to provide for her family. In the 50 years that this then colony and now nation has evolved, we've moved past a lot of things, but not typifications like this from popular culture and music that all too often remind girls to stay in their, quote, place. Young girls all too often are told that they are too much. You're too sassy. You're too womanish. You're too willful. Too much, but never enough. Not pretty enough. Not long-haired enough. Not quiet enough. Not demure enough. Not ladylike enough. All too often, as women, we reinforce these terrible notions. And we impose them on brown-skinned girls who already have the weight of the world on their shoulders, who will throughout the course of their life have to battle racism and sexism and classism, all the while contributing to nationalism. I know that this is true because I too was once a brown-skinned girl. And in grade school, my report card could be counted on religiously to say two things. Crystal is a great student, <laughs> but she talks too much. Let us imagine if instead of saying that I was a good student but talked too much, that my teachers had opted to say, Crystal is a good student and she talks much, and this may help her to do well in college, and one day she may be a college professor, and 
and one day she may be a storyteller and one day she may have the opportunity to stand in a forum such as this and struggle to keep her story within 18 minutes. But all too often, brown skinned girls don't get that message. In addition to talking too much, we're also discouraged from talking back. I have another story for that one. <laughs> when I was in the fourth grade, I asked my teacher who was busied at her desk if I could leave for a moment and go to fourth grade heaven. You know it well, the bathroom <laughs> in the middle of class. Surprisingly, she agreed. And so I ventured out, it wasn't too far, didn't stay too long. I stopped for a drink of water. <laughs> Sue me. <laughs> but as I approached the classroom door, she stood big and tall and she wagged her finger. She said, go directly to the vice principal's office. This was not fourth grade heaven. <laughs> this would be the exact opposite of that. <laughs> this would be hell. I went to parochial school. And my vice principal prided herself on a paddle that she used on children like me. I believe it was called Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Maybe Mr. Pepper. Or pain or enforcer, but you get the picture. So I said to her, why? And she said, because you didn't ask to go to the bathroom. And I said, but I did. She said, no, you didn't. I said, but Jonathan, you were there. You heard me ask her. You heard her say yes. You remember? And Jonathan was a challenged student, as was I, from time to time. And he said, yes, but Crystal did ask you. And the teacher replied, well, I was distracted. And I may have told you yes, but I didn't mean to tell you yes. And I said, oh, no, that's your problem. Okay. <laughs> because my mommy don't pay all this money for me to come here and pee on myself. And I asked you to go, and you can't keep track of it. And I went, oh, I said, you got to bring the vice principal here, because I am not going. <laughs> Now, many of you were probably on the side of my nine-year-old self right up until that moment when I did what? Talk back. Because as a nine-year-old brown-skinned girl, how dare I talk back at the authority of this 20-something-year-old novice, quite overwhelmed Canadian teacher who was just happy probably to be in the Bahamas until she encountered a child such as me. <laughs> now, the idea here is that it's problematic that we discourage traits in young girls that we admire in strong women. There is no strong woman you will ever meet who has ever accepted that she was either too much or not enough. There is no strong woman that you will ever meet who did not at some point talk back. It is required of us in the world in which we live, a world again that forces upon us the undueness of the weight of racism, of sexism, and of classism. That we challenge those structures that are more often than not built on patriarchy even though it was my grandmother's hands that greased my scalp and my grandmother's hands that drew out prickles from the bottom of my feet and that rolled dough boys and that baked bread, it is still the patriarchy that governs our society and says all too often to young girls, everything has a place, everything in its place, including you. What I'd like to suggest is that we reconsider this curriculum around how we educate young girls, how we um, teach them about their somebodyness, how we talk to them about enoughness and about talking back. I have found uh, many successful women in my life, and I have been uh, very fortunate to sit at their feet, to 
eat at their tables and to talk on their telephones late at night and early into the morning. And I've observed some things that are fairly common in all of them. And if you don't mind, I'd like to share just three of them with you. The first is the willingness to begin again. The second is that the more you do, the more you'll do. And the third is that no matter how long you live, you will never outlive the need to be courageous. Let me begin by saying that life happens. You know, we teach little girls what? We read them fairy tales, and they say, and they lived happily ever after. The end. <laughs> and we know that life doesn't operate like that. You know, a friend of mine very recently said, oh, but you know, because we have to teach girls that you may kiss a few frogs before you find your prince. And I said, oh, no, we don't teach young girls about who they find. We teach them about who they are so that when they are found, they are valued and they are loved and they are appreciated and they are treated and accorded with the respect and dignity that they deserve. And that if you are not found, that you learn to keep your own company. <laughs> so the principle of beginning again. I had a great example of this as a young child. I went to a parochial school and my principal there, um, the one whose vice principal's office I refused to go to, uh, she was like a queen. Her name was uh, Geneva Rutherford. And, and when uh, she was a teenager, she lived on about 600 uh, squared kilometers called uh, Long Island in the southeastern Bahamas. And um, it was an agrarian lifestyle. It was very communal based. But at 15 years old, she found that uh, there was really limited opportunity. Uh, she would not be able to go to high school unless she made the difficult decision to begin again, uh, not just to go to NASA or to be educated, but how would she get there? So 15-year-old then Geneva Major decides that she's going to join the convent. And she joins the convent and it affords her the opportunity to get this education in Nassau and then abroad in Minnesota. And she comes back and she's Sister Vivian. And uh, Sister Vivian gives church service for about a decade and she decides, I'm going to begin again. I'm going to be single Geneva major. And then she gets married and she becomes Geneva Rutherford. And then she, you know, becomes again the school principal. And at some point she gets afforded the opportunity to become the nation's first female vice president of the Senate. She's begun again and again, over and over and over. The more you do, the more you'll do. Perfect example, my high school vice principal, admittedly my cousin, Anita Doherty, in her young uh, years, much like me, was quite the athlete, okay? Much like me. Stay with me. I was. And, uh, you know, she was a triple crown uh, winner in tennis. She played in the Commonwealth Games. Every sport imaginable, she dominated. Um, and now she finds herself stricken with arthritis. And no day. No day for her is a pain-free day. But every single day, even though her hands are now immobilized by the disease, you could see Anita either pointing at a student here, there, or somewhere, and pecking at her computer. Long lists of things to do she's getting done. The final example. No matter how long you live, you'll never outlive the need to be courageous. Is a woman who was neither uh, black nor native born, Mary Nab. Mary Nab came to the Bahamas as a teacher and as a veteran of World War II. And she decided that she would fight for the rights of Bahamian school children. She would fight for public education. She would fight for the rights of Haitian immigrants. Mary Nab died in 2004, but for the last 12 years of her life worked as a teacher completely unpaid. She never forgot the need to be courageous. So what I'd like to suggest is that we hold fast to these lessons and that we teach them to girls. We teach them that they're enough. We teach them to talk back. We teach them to begin again. We teach them uh, that the more they do, the more they do. And we teach them that they must, must, must always be courageous. In doing so, we keep alive the stories of women like my grandmother and Ms. Rutherford and Ms. Doherty and Ms. Knapp. In doing so, we keep alive powerful stories and we tell young girls, instead of messages about 
impossibility, we give them messages of possibility. Yes. That one day someone like me could stand in this place with a PhD, a DD, a MD, or no D at all, <laughs> and say to the world that brown skin girls matter. Amen. Thank you. Right.